My name is Morris Pomerantz, and I'm here. It's my great pleasure to uh, welcome you here on behalf of the New York uh, University Abu Dhabi uh, Institute. Uh, this uh, performance is part of a two-day conference on courts and performance. So today and tonight, we're treated to a special performance um, uh, of traditional Arabic music between history and modern performance. Um, and it's my great pleasure to introduce to you right now our two performers this evening, uh, George Dimitri Soa and Suzanne Meyer Soa. George was born in Alexandria, Egypt, where he studied at the Institute of Arabic Music, specializing in voice, music theory, and the Qanun, who he'll, he'll tell you something about that um, today, I'm sure, or tonight, I'm sure. Uh, after immigrating to Canada in 1970, George studied ethnomusicology at the University of Toronto, where he received a doctorate in Arabic musicology. He has taught at both the University of Toronto and York University, and currently performs and teaches in the Toronto area. Suzanne Meyersoa was born in Cleveland, Ohio, and holds degrees in both piano performance and library science. She too is a scholar of Arabic musicology, and currently is the assistant librarian in the faculty of, of, music, of the music library at the University of Toronto. The accomplishments of these two individuals, both in performance and in scholarship, are too numerous for me to mention in full here. Um, so I'll just give you a taste, I guess. Both have, given you, both have given performances of Arabic music in America, Europe, and the Middle East, and have been broadcast on the CBC, among other uh, uh, major uh, networks. Their work, both collectively and individually, have earned them numerous grants from the Canadian government. In addition, George received a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Egyptian Ministry of Culture for his research into Arabic music. George is the author of numerous articles and studies on classical Arabic music, including the monograph Music Performance Practice in the Early Abbasid Era. And Suzanne has authored uh, many articles and studies uh, and is currently working on a project on female singers in the Abbasid court, is that right? Uh, and, and has also written in the Garland Ex Encyclopedia of World Music. Together, they are, a, I think, a formidable ensemble, and, and certainly um, I, I'm looking forward to this. And uh, um, so we warmly welcome you here tonight. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Uh, I talk too much and play very little, so I'm going to play first to make sure that you get something. And we're going to start with the dance of Sayyid Muhammad, who was a canoon player like myself, who composed this really lovely, lovely piece of music. Not only it's nice to dance to, but it's also nice to listen to. And very likely, this, this piece of music was danced to by Tahir Karyuka or Sami Gamal, very likely in the court of King Farouk. Are you ready? Sure. Thank you. For <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So this is my friend, the Kanun, and you must be a masochist to play it. It has 78 strings, and to make matters worse, I got one that has 81. And it does not stay in tune, no matter what you do. Or you, sometimes it stays. So it's a lot of work, but you have to love it to do it. It's a lovely instrument. And the, the, the term kanon comes from Greek. Itself may have come from ancient Assyria, kan um, meaning the cane. And the cane is standard of measurement, hence, the kanun is an instrument of measurement, an instrument of law, hence kanun and law. Uh, the first time we hear in Greek music about the kanun is 400 BC with Euclid. He invented the monochord, the one string kanun. So you can put a bridge under the one, that one string. If you divide it in half, you get the octave. You divide it in, in thirds, you get the fifth, etc. So it's a way to teach the students that the notes of your scale can be expressed in terms of, string, uh, of the, the proportion of the strings. Not happy with it because you have to measure, stop, play. Measure, play. You cannot really play a piece of music this way. So he decided to make the eight string polychord, eight string canon. And then because the Greek system had two octaves, we have in the second century AD in Alexandria the invention of the 15 string polychord that is right here. And I hope you all have this uh, handout. And we hear about it in ancient Greek sources. And it's really hard to understand the material. Al-Farabi, may Allah bless his soul, revisited the canon of second century Alexandria. And in his typical man, he would say, one of the ancient told us how to build an instrument to teach the skills. He didn't say who it was. It was really our dear friend, Batlamios Ptolemy, who was also an astronomer and geographer, and you name it. What he did in that grand sistema, the double octave, 15 strings, and by the way, Arabic music till today, in theory, we talk about the double octave from Yaka to Nawa, Nawa to Sahm. Even though the canon has more than, three, than, more than two octaves, we're still stuck back to second century Alexandria with that grand system of the Greeks. So what he did, he said, okay, I'm going to build a big rectangle, 15 strings, all tuned to the same uh, note. All the strings have the same thickness, same length, same material, same density. And I'm going to put 14 bridges under the 14 strings. The bottom one has no string on it, but the next 14 will have, will have bridges. So you can tell the student, at this particular measurement, you get maqam rust. At this particular measurement, you get bayati. The one you have here is the major mode. You can really, if you measure it carefully, you're going to get the major mode on this particular uh, design. OK? Now, we don't have any graphic representation of the Greek canon. We don't have it in the seven extant manuscript of Farabi. He talks about there is no picture of it. It's been reinvented and re-explained in the 14th century, and this is where the picture comes from. And if you look carefully, the top of the picture has all the measurement. It's a ruler that tells you where to place your strings. That's the canon. How did the canon that was used for education become a music instrument? We don't know. Because in the Arab sources, all the time is the oud, the lute, that's used to explain the, the ratio of the strings, not the kanun. For some reason, the kanun became the law, and then it switched from a didactic educational instrument into a performance one. How? We don't know. We go a bit further in history. The top left, the top right, sorry, is a kanun from Isfahan from the 14th century. It's a magnificent manuscript. The last chapter tells you about how to make music instruments, what type of wood, how to temper the wood, how, what kind of strings to use. They had gut strings, they had silk strings, and they tell you the technology used to manufacture all the strings. It's a lovely, lovely instrument, uh, manuscript known as Kenzet Tohaf. And there is a very sad man playing in a showing, not a playing position, playing the kanun, and they call it Samtir. That's from 14th century Cairo. Okay? 
uh, the manuscript is called Kashf al Humum. The very bottom is the canoon of Edward Lane, who visited Egypt in the 19th century, and he gave a wonderful description of many, many things, including music instrument, including the canoon that you have down here. It has no levers at all. The canoon here has levers. You flip them up and down, and you get flat, you get sharp, you get half flat, half sharp, commas, half commas, you name it. A very complicated tone system. And we owe the invention of the quarter tone to Mansur Zalzal, who was at the court of Harun al-Rashid, part of the uh, Mausili family, Ishaq al-Mausili and Ibrahim al-Mausili. And he put his finger between what we call the black and white keys of a piano. I mean, no piano back then. But the idea, he put his finger in between. And that note became known as Wusta Zalzal. Well, this finger is the Wusta. Sababa was like he put his finger in between and created that what we call the quarter tone that became the mark of Arabic music. Except that there are two different types of wasta uh, that did the quarter tone. Plus the wasta force, plus the regular wasta. So there you have four different wasta. Um, pardon me. So Mansur Zalzal was a lutenist at the court of Harun Rashid. And to take on the papers that were given today by Maurice and Nadia uh, about the faux pas at the court and the, uh, the good behavior at the court, I just want to tell you, it's very easy to be a musician today compared to the Abbasid musicians. The Abbasid musician does not play on stage and he does not know the crowd. He sits in a majlis. He knows the audience. He knows their likes and dislikes. And the audience is very demanding. Hence, to make it at the Abbasid court, you have to know 5,000 songs, or don't even dare to appear. Because you cannot say, oh, sorry, Harun Rashid, I forgot that song. Sorry, al Ma'mun, I don't know that song. You're finished, you're, you're toasted. It cannot happen. On top of this, you have to watch. Some of the uh, errors in music performance stem from the fact that people probably were not aware or had too much to drink. There are four, four errors that we read over and over in Kitab al aghani of Isfahani. One was to make fun of people with white hair like me. So if you have a caliph who has white hair and you mention a song that makes fun of somebody with white hair, then you're in trouble. Number two, if you make a pass at the girlfriend of the caliph or the prince, the sharia, in songs, I mean, you're not going to make a pass so stupidly, but make it in a very hidden way, then you're going to be in trouble again. If you praise the enemy of the caliph, you'll be in trouble, etc. Now, going to uh, the background of the musician now, best of time, on top of the 5,000 songs they had to know, they had to be also, they're required to have the background of the boon companion that Nadia talked about today, Nadim and Zarif. That to play back gammon with the uh, with the uh, caliph, they went on uh, hunting expedition with the caliph. Everything at the court, Umayyad or Abbasid court, was punctuated by songs from birth to death. Every event was sung. Uh, they also educated uh, the uh, the princes and educated the uh, the caliphs. So they had a very important role, and it was a whole institution, uh, and they were paid very very well. So it was in the best interest of the musician to watch his tongue, to watch his poetry, to watch the like and dislike of his patron. The next thing I'm going to talk about is the aesthetics of Arabic music. And I'll tell you my own experience, my first canoon lesson. A very scary one. Just give me time to change my stops here. At the age of 10, I started to learn piano. At the age of 19, I said to my father, I love the canoon too much. I've got to learn canoon. So I went to Mr. Milad. It was in his 70s. Old, old world. My son, you want to learn canoon? Yeah. Here's a piece of music. That's how we fix the stops. Don't bother me. When you learn it, come and see me. So I played something like this. Oh, pardon me.
very scared. Not one mistake. And the canoe is difficult because one hand is here, the other hand is there. Far apart, you cannot see the two hands. One hand has to go to fly blind. And instead of telling me, wonderful, no mistakes, he said to me, George, somebody die in your family? <laughs> I said, no. He said, this is a funeral march. You have to shakla and la'la, you have to make it alive and make it beautiful. So I said, how? So he gave me quite a lesson. This is so beautiful. Can you repeat it? Of course not. So he did something like this, maybe. Being again not aware of the aesthetics of the Karun, I said, no, I want to hear the first one. So there is no first one, there is no second one. It's one piece of music. Every time you do it, it's going to be different. That's the beauty of Arabic music. You can never repeat your piece, unless you're a bad performer. If you're a good performer, you're very creative, you have at your disposal a lot of ornamentation. Take us back to the time of Farabi, and let's see what Farabi had to tell us. When the Wazir al-Karhi in Buwayhi time asked him to write a treatise about the ancient, meaning the Greeks, he did three things. He wrote about the Greeks. He went to the practitioner. He was very fond of the practitioner. He was very respectful of the musicians. Often you talk about, oh, Elateia, oh, dumb musicians. They're not dumb, they, they know a lot. So he had a lot of respect for them. But he also went to the Arabic humanities. So not only Greek philosophy, Greek logic, Greek mathematics, Greek physics, and metaphysics, he also went to the Arabic humanities and Persian humanities. So he went to Arabic grammar, phonology, poetics, prosody, you name it, architecture, textile, etc., etc. Even Quranic sciences, Hadr and Tartil, to talk about the tempo. Hadr is the rapid recitation of the Holy Quran, but very clearly, Tartil is the very elaborate chanting of the Holy Quran. So you want to say fast music, Hadr, slow music, Tartil. And he did this because the patron knew nothing about music. So you had to find paradigms and models from all kinds of learning. That's why I always say, you want to get a good panorama of Arabic and Islamic civilization, go to music. Everything is there. So architecture and textile. He said, well, Al-Farabi said, there are two types of melodies. You have the melody, the skeleton of the melody, that's the minimum required. And there are addition to the melodies. Tazidat or tazinat. Tazidat means additions, and tazinat to make it beautiful. And he said that's evident in the buildings. You have the mud, bricks, you have the wood, and textile, you have the horizontal and vertical lines that meet the cloth. But that's the very basic existence of your material. It's not beautiful. Nobody's going to buy it. You have to add to it beauty. So you're going to paint, you're going to have engraving, carving, and amenities. Washroom and kitchen. So this is very important for Farabi, because imagine a building without kitchen and bathroom. So for him, the ornamentation is the amenities, is the kitchen and bathroom, and the carving, of course. But the ornamentation is crucial to make music so beautiful. The same thing with the textile. We have the fringes in the clothes, the design, the embroidery, embroidery, as you know, the Islamic world is very well known for that. Uh, then he went to other things in the in Islamic, uh, you know, uh, the, whole, the whole learning, that is. But before you get tired of me talking, let's play another piece of music, then we'll talk more. I'm going to play you Isamai one of the early semi that uh, were composed. Semi come from semi, as you mentioned today. Uh, 
It has two meanings, a piece in 10-8, and you guys are going to learn 10-8, all of you are going to clap it. You see how, I have a trick for you. And also, it's something played at the Samea, at the closing of the Sufi ceremony. And this particular one is lovely, and it goes through many, many modes. Just let me make sure my stops are right here. masterpiece of music, thank you. Uh, it's called Sama'a Ti'il, and people uh, don't know who composed it, but my teacher, Amin Fahmi, said to me that it was Ibrahim al aryan apparently, who composed it, but never laid his authorship to it. Now, this is a 10-8, and we're going to talk about musical notation. We had, apparently, a very precise notation system, as you hear uh, uh, from two anecdotes, only two anecdotes from Kitab al aghani where Ishaq al mursili composed the song, and Prince Ibrahim ibn al-Mahdi said to him in a letter, Ishaq, I heard your song is fantastic. Can you please send it to me? So instead of sending a, a musician friend or a slave boy or a slave girl to teach it to him, he wrote it down. Apparently, it was so well written down, so precise, that Ibrahim played it exactly like Ishaq did. What was the system? We don't know, unfortunately. But we have notation system developed by Al-Kindi using the Arut, uh, the circle and the vertical bar, 
superseded again by Farabi in the 10th century with the 10 and the 10 system, the 10 double 10 system, relation one to two to four for the durations. And then a much more elaborate system in the 13th century in tablature notation, where they tell you this finger goes on that thread on that string and the value is one or two or three or four. And Owen Wright was the first to transcribe them. And there was a friend of mine in Lebanon who made a CD of the six songs from the 13th century. A very, a very uh, good system of notation was developed by Safiy al-Din al-Urmawi al-Baghdadi in Baghdad in the 13th century. He borrowed the Arud notation, Dawair al-Arud, borrowed the, that circular notation and transplanted to music. And that system obtained all the way to the early 20th century in Arabic music and Ottoman music. Now, can you pass me this? Or maybe you can hold it? It's a very simple system. You divide a circle in the number of beats. And all of, how many of you cannot read music? I hope all of you cannot read music. You cannot read music. That's fantastic. In five seconds, you're going to be reading rhythm. OK, now before you get into this, Huh? What? I can't hear you. Oh, we did this because we used to go to schools, junior schools in, uh, in Toronto, kids in grade one and grade two, within five seconds they can play 10-8. <laughs> See? So, uh, you have two types of sounds in, in modern uh, Arabic. You have the dom and the tak. That's all you need to know. Just promise me not to play the dom too loud and the tak too loud, it's going to hurt your hand, okay? After you do this, I'm going to tell you the other uh, system that you have. So you divide the circle into 10, and you have dum, D for dum. When you have nothing, you play nothing, but mentally, you supply the beat. Tac, T, you play it like this, and then when you have nothing, you play nothing. So if you go from the top, clockwise, dum, can you move back, Morgana, they cannot see you. Ready? Dom, nothing, nothing. Tak, nothing. Dom, dom. Tak, nothing, nothing. Dom. Tak. Dom, dom. Tak. Fantastic. You passed. You're fantastic. Okay. One more time. Nine, ten. Dom, rest, rest. Tak, rest. Dom, dom. Tak. Dom, rest. Fantastic. Now, here it is. Uh, I'm going to play a piece of music, but I'm not going to sing it because I have a terrible voice. It's the famous Tamabeda et Asanna. If you can hold it, you can leave it here. Probably that can help us out. That's the first classical song I ever learned. It's a real masterpiece <coughs> composed by uh, Salim al Masri, I think, late 19th century. And it's a classic, everybody knows it. So, are you ready? Now, in practice, you have to supply me with two, two bars, then I enter. Are you ready? Nine, ten. Dum, rest, rest, tak, rest. You see? Thank you very much. We have to thank, we have to thank Sophia Dean for, no, we're not done yet. We have to thank Sophia Dean for this. 
Uh, but before that, you have to thank Farabi. Because when al karhi asked him to write this fantastic grand book of music, uh, he wrote two chapters on rhythm. Ras tub It's like putting stone on stone. It's impossible to understand. So somebody, or Karhi, or somebody said, Abu Nasr, we can't understand what you're talking about. So he partially revised it in Kitab al-Iqa'at. Then partially revised everything in Kitab Ihsa al-Iqa'at. So you have two chapters from the Grand Book of Music, Kitab al-Musik al-Kabir. One lovely treatise, Kitab al-Iqa'at, then in Kitab Ihsa al-Iqa'at. Then he borrowed a sixth century Byzantine notation system, Ta, ten, and ten, double ten, to notate hundreds of musical examples. And he analyzed rhythm. No scholar to our day, east or west, has produced a treatise where you mention the meter and then you, you, you uh, analyze all the variations. I can do boom, pa, pa, boom, waltz, eh? boom, or oh. Boom, taka, taka, tum, raka, taka, tum, tak, tak, tum, ta, ta. This is all variation of the main thing. Farabi did. He said, this is darb al-ramal, darb al-staqil al-awwal, staqil al-thani, and these are the variation that I heard people perform. So this is somebody who is very brilliant, but he's also a performer, and he spent a lot of time studying Aristotle logic. Which take us now to what he did with the rhythm. He explained the meter, explained the rhythm, then he articulated, abstracted 16 ornamental technique to do the shakla and the lala, to make it beautiful. See? Now, going back to music, you have the 10 8. 10 means 10 beats to a bar, like a waltz is 3, 10 is 10. But you don't go to me, ta ra 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 ra, that's very boring. Huh? You have to tailor it, tafsil. And that's what Al-Farabi, very interesting term used, a tafsil. So if you look at it and analyze it, you have a set of three, a set of two, a set of five. Dom, rest, rest, tak, rest, dom, dom, tak, rest, rest. Three plus two plus five will make ten. This is the tafsil that will change the meter. You're going to derive the mode, the iqa, from the meter. Then you're going to derive from the derivative, another derivative, which is rhythm. So sixth century before Newton Leibniz, they invented calculus, when d, dx by dt equal v, the, the velocity, d, v by dt is the uh, acceleration, you have the derivative of the derivative. You have the meter, 10, which is very dumb. You Put variation to it, you have the derivative, the eqa, the rhythmic mode, as the Latin will call it. Then you have the rhythm, which is the derivative of the derivative. That's what Farabi did back then, without knowing Newton or Leibniz. And he thought it all sort of by, by intuition, in this phenomenal mind. And I'm sorry to say, we have not produced in the Arab world or the Islamic world somebody of the caliber of Al-Farabi. The other thing he will say, this is like poetry. Like your bait is made of taf'ilat, and every taf'il is made of syllable, long and short. You combine the syllable to make taf'ilat, you combine taf'ilat to make buhur. So he does the same thing here. Sorry? So he makes the same thing here. Musical part, ajza', is very much uh, the idea of Khil ibn Ahmed, etc., uh, etc., et to analyze uh, the, the whole idea of, of, of the meter and the rhythm. Uh, then he tells us, I mean, uh, we mentioned dum and tak, and if you look at the dum, dum, it's a deep sound, and mm, I can prolong it. Tak is a high level. Musawatat murtafa, musawatat munkhafida. And then k, you cannot really prolong the k. Tak is brief. But Al-Farabi was much richer. He said, we have four, five terms, not the dum and the tak only. He, he didn't say that, but he said, we have, and again to to take care of his patron, al karhi and to make things available to him, he borrowed from Arabic grammar. He said the naqra qawiyya, that's what Ishaq al-Mawsiri calls, naqra tamma or naqra qawiyya, a strong attack or a resounding attack. He said, I'm going to call it a tanween, like waladan, the postposition you put at the end. Hmm? Waladan or waladun, it rings. 
So this is one type. And then the other one, al-haraka, al-walada, shorter than dan and softer than dan. Ah. And then he said, raum al-haraka wa ishmam al-haraka. So he's going to go again to Quranic term and terms from phonology, terms from grammar. He's using a seba way, a kitab. He's using many other things. So much richer again. He has four sounds. You have only dum and tak. Uh, the other thing he did that was really magnificent with this variation technique, he went to Euclid, the postulatum of Euclid in geometry. Now, just to remind you, from Euclid to Farabi is 1,400 years. From Farabi to us is only 1,000 years. And all this stuff was preserved and translated in Baghdad. For, for 200 years, we had bit al-Hikmah, phenomenal amount of translation done, and redone, and redone, and redone. So when Farabi came, from Transoxiana to the Uzbekistan to Baghdad. He had behind him 200 years of translation. Superb work, including, of course, the postulatum of Euclid in geometry, which says, without which you cannot explain geometry, a point has no length, a line has no surface, a surface has no volume. Al Farabi said, a nakra, the attack, has no time. It is timeless. Already, Al Farabi is telling us about a fourth dimension. A fourth dimension, the time, is implying all this stuff. So he said the attack is timeless. It separates the past from the future. It happens in the end. And, Alif Mad Danun, the now. By itself, it has no time, but it separates the past from the future. Having said so, he could add attacks and remove attacks and not change the meter. Aristoxenes could not do it. Aristotle could not do it. Al Kenji could not do it. Al Farabi did it. By doing so, you can add attacks, remove attacks, not change the meter. I can do om, pam, pam, om, pam, or om, pam, 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 om, still three, four. I can also remove attacks. Thomas Moody, dum, ta, ta, om, pa, om, pa, pa, om. I'm going to remove the dum, ta, ta, um, ta, 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 um, ta, and I'm not changing the, the, the ikhla. So this is where the genius of Farabi lies. Now, in... Uh, Absolute love for our friend Zef Feldman. We're going to play for you a piece in 176 beats to a bar. Waltz is three, this is 176. It's a beautiful piece from the Ottoman court, and it predates Bach by 50 years. 50 years before Bach, the Ottoman produced magnificent music. And it sort of pays me some time that. In the Arab world, you put down the Turks too much. They, they did a lot of wonderful things, too. You cannot really be bad to them. This is just my, my spiel here. So this one is uh, Bashar Frost Sharif. I don't have better light. I turned 65 a few weeks ago. I need my glasses. And by the way, the notation was done by Dimitri Kantimir. If you want more questions, please ask if he's the specialist. And I don't have a Turkish kanun to tune it with commas, but I have a Syrian one with half commas. So it's approximate to uh, what the system was. If there are notes out of tune, I cannot take the time to tune them. We don't have time. So pretend they're in tune. That's part of the. <laughs> no, this one, I ha this one I have to fix. Eh? Give, give me a minute.
etc. Okay. Don't worry, she's going to count. You don't have to count 176. The whole piece is five bar, by the way. Absolutely magnificent. If you want to clear your heart, then Haris will do next. If you want to clear your heart or your mind of any pain, this kind of music just cleans it up in seconds. It's so, be it's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. I wish I had composed it. It's not me. <laughs> Time.
How are we doing for time? Uh, you can start in about 45 minutes. We have time for one more piece, or shall we? Yeah? Yeah, if you want, okay. This is Rast Qadim in 1416 from the same collection of Kantimir. And uh, there is a part in it where you really, really are floating and try to unite with the beloved, try to unite with, with, the, with the Almighty, just so beautiful. What I forgot to mention, Ibn Sina wrote also a music, maybe not of the caliber of Al-Farabi, because he was not a musician, but he invented two very nice words, Nathr and Nagamat and Nadhm and Nagamat. Nathr and Nagamat, prose music, music that is not arranged temporarily, it's like our speech, and Nadhm and Nagamat, poetry music, where you have a beat and it's uh, munazzam, okay? So, I can do something like this for you, taksim. You, ca you cannot feel a beat, it's sort of floating. stop is not that you're lost, but it's part of the music. It's like speaking, unless you're like one of my neighbors. She speaks, never stops. But this, no, you're not my neighbor. So there is a lot of stops to imitate prose, speech, but also to get the feedback from the samia. samia. So if the audience is very quiet, it means I'm a lousy, horrible, terrible performer. If I stop and people say, Allah, add, add, more, I feel, I feel happy because, you know, you like what I do. And I feel I'm not lonely here. And I feel there's a feedback. So say something. <laughs> <laughs> Joking. <laughs> okay, this one is a very short meter, only 14. By the way, 176 was not the longest. In the 13th century, you have Deira Tel Me'atayn. 200 beats to a bar. Again, you have to have patrons, you have to have court to patronize this sort of crazy, beautiful music. You have to have court to do that. Always laugh because you, you always see the last two. Uh, 13, 14. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. In conclusion, long live the Abbasid period, long live Farah and Isfahani. <laughs>
I learned this from a cassette that the dancer gave me from a flute player from Egypt, Anwar Saleh, the Salamiya. No training, nothing, his ear and his genius. And there are six different uh, Sufi dances. This is one of them, it's just superb. Yo. And uh, the ostinato is Ayub al-Masri, which is used in Zar to repulse the evil and the devil, used in the Zikr ceremony in Sufi music, and also in dance and a lot of pop, uh, pop and folkloric music. 